Hello, Spookies, and welcome to the Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours, Ghoulie, Ricky J. Duarte. Today, I'm joined by a really exciting and remarkable guest. This is a hugely influential person in my life, an inspirational person, an educator, and a talent, a brilliant mind, and an all-around wonderful human being. We're welcoming my high school theater teacher, Esther Rosevere. Hi, Esther. Hi, it's so good to be with you. I'm so happy to have you talking about this specific film. Today we're talking about The Bad Seed from the year 1956. This is uh, this is a hell of a movie. It is. And I wanted to talk to you for many reasons. This film is based on the Broadway play by Maxwell Anderson, which in turn was based on the novel by William March. Now, you, in your teaching days, directed a production of the stage version of The Bad Seed. I sure did. I had to do this play. You know, I had to do it. I I saw, well, I read the play years ago, and then I saw the movie, because I'm an old classic buff anyway. And I just had to do this, because I thought it was eerie and scary in a very creepy way, you know, just so subtle that maybe some people wouldn't even get what was going on underneath. And so I just had to do it. I like, I, you know, being a play, it's kind of fun to scare people too sometimes. So, <laughs> you know, especially high school kids, right? You know, sure. So it was fun. It was fun. Now you are not, you are not a horror movie person at all. No, no, not even no. a little horror bit. Movies. No, no, no. I horror movies scare scare the crap out of me. They do. I I will dream about it for days on end and I'm the victim and it goes on and on. Yeah, I it's it's an image I can't get out. So it is something that I really do not enjoy. I don't like to be scared, but for some reason this particular, you know, the bad seed was subtle enough, you know, and there was no blood and such so yeah it was it was the psychology of the whole thing i like i like those i love i love thrillers you know i like that absolutely i i do think the the horror of this movie has maybe deteriorated or eroded a little bit over time and you know audiences might not find it scary in the ways that they did in when this back then and this play came out and we'll talk about the reasons why this movie was so scary uh, as we go along but so just to, to go back, uh, yes, Esto was my high school theater teacher and we worked on a number of productions together. And, yes. you know, I, I was thinking you were about my you. assistant, too. Yeah, you were just my right hand. I tell you, you know, I, I want to thank you for that introduction. That was very, very, very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. It's right back at you. You know, so much love right back at you. You're always special in my heart. So go ahead. <laughs> well, you're special in mine too. I, I feel so fortunate that, you know, we've been able to remain in contact and, 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 you know, be friends throughout the years because you're, you're so valuable to me. You and William, uh, your husband have both been monumental. I was, I was just thinking about you. Actually, I went to Ohio to see a production. My best friend directed a production of Carrie the Musical. And so wow. I went to see that and I dressed in you know for opening night i had on a sequin blade a black sequin blazer and a red tuxedo shirt and i had my black rock star eye makeup on and leather pants and wow when i was younger and in high school if i saw someone dressed like that i would be maybe afraid to uh talk to them but kind of want to be them and it was you know around the time that we were you know you were my teacher that i started to really realize who i am and come to terms with being a gay person 
and right. you know started to come out and there were young people at this production who were telling me you look great and you know oh That's i love cool. your outfit and it was like oh i got <laughs> i've become that person now and you know i know that you and my experience with you and your the way that you allowed me to explore you know myself through the theater and through the arts was a big impact on me becoming comfortable and knowing exactly who i am so Thanks for that. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you did used to wear hats. Oh man, I was a hat person. <laughs> you are such a hat person, and I was a hat person. Yeah. Oh, to, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yes, Remember you opening had nights? We have red, our hats. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I have like 30 hats. Yeah. yeah too bad they don't wear them where I am living now. But you know. <laughs> you look great in a hat too. You wore each one of them beautifully. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So did you. He was awesome, and I love the way you always dressed up. See, you were. You were your own, whether you thought you were or not, you were definitely, um, you gave the impression that you were becoming who you were meant to be, finding your path. You know what I mean? Just becoming stronger and stronger in how you wanted to present yourself, you know? And I'm so glad that theater gave you that outlet. That's one of the joys of theater is that theater accepts everybody, you know, it's, It's what you do. It's not what you look like, how, you know, all that. It's not. It's about your talent and what you contribute. That's the important thing. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. You know, so, aside from the wonderful things I just mentioned, as an actor and as a, you know, a theatrical professional now, the work ethic and my uh, my approach to a lot of the things that I do comes from those core theatrical elements that you instilled in me. Back then, you know, you as an educator had a huge impact on every single person that you touched through the years, you know, that you that went through your classroom. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My 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 theory was always that if I was willing to give my best and I always did, no matter what, my best, then I would expect those around me to give their best, too. And I didn't accept anything less because I knew you had it in you. And I just wanted you to see that and feel that and know that, you know, that was important. Yeah. And um, my whole thing was, if you touch one life, wow, you know, what a gift. And you never, the thing about theater is that you never know who you're touching. You could have someone in that audience, right, who's a, a, a child or, you know, and they see something or, you know, an adult and a trick. You just don't know. And I just love that aspect of it, you know. Yeah. That's true. I was in a play that it was a very long run and it was not a great play, but I got, you know, I, to, to not, I don't want to say push through it because it really is a, a privilege every time that I'm able to be in a show, but you know, to, I had I, to remind myself someone in this audience, this might be the first time that they ever see live theater and mm -hmm. this could be a lasting lifelong impression for this person. You know, it's, you're not doing yes. it. You're not doing it for you. And you're not doing it only for the audience. You're doing it for that connection that you you build yes. with the audience. You yes. Know? And that's what we used to talk about. The first, you know, the first time. Yeah. Every night is the first time because you don't know. Yeah. You don't know who's out there and what their experiences are and, and how you will impact them. You know, and, and that makes the whole thing such a connection, such a yeah. human bond. You know, that's what I love about theater. It's live. <laughs> there's this there's there's this exactly this tension of this connection where you are trusting the audience to let you take them somewhere and the audience is trusting you to deliver something that will change them yes right that's what storytelling yes. is yes and and you never know what's going to happen and every single performance is different might not be huge, huge differences, but it's never the same. It can't be. Right. And it's never perfect. It's no. never perfect. And that's okay, too. That's okay. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, yeah. that's well, what I love about it. And as Esther mentioned, I did assistant direct her her opus, her wonderful production, her <laughs> final production at the high school that I attended of The Wizard of Oz. And man, oh that was a hell of a show. That was, that was, I, I don't know if people can understand how, I mean, that was just an amazing production. We actually did the movie. Yeah. I reproduced the movie. That was my goal. Uh, and we worked, that wasn't a eight week 
you know, rehearsal. That was a six month, let's work for six months and get this right. And that's yeah. what we did. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. Flying monkeys and flying people in the air. <laughs> I loved your makeup. Yeah. Didn't, oh well, I have I have a fond memory of you putting on our scarecrows makeup. You it, it just you putting on the makeup of our leads was so important. I I was I went on I went on stage as Uncle Henry. The, I think it was the final night because our Uncle Henry couldn't make it. And I remember, you know, we knew that you were retiring and this would be your last time putting makeup on me. And I started crying, and you were like, "You have to stop crying." because I'm putting on makeup, you're gonna run your eyeliner right now. <laughs> Speaking of flying, didn't Glinda get stuck? She got stuck in yes, the, in the she fly. Did. Yeah. Our yeah. tables got stuck and that was, <laughs> I'll never forget it. it was a matinee filled with children yeah. and there's Glinda up there and um, oh my gosh. And 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 our poor lead was not, not knowing what to do. Who would know what to do? No, if, and oh, so she kept I was... walking in the circle around Munchkin Land. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the, the 20 little kids didn't know what to do. They couldn't yeah. come out, come out. Exactly. So <laughs> you were so, so good I, work. We had children were uh, as the munchkins. So basically everyone's little sibling, uh, not everyone, yep. the talented little siblings were allowed to come. <laughs> uh, <Yep. laughs> they were munchkins. And, oh, I did the, I did the facial hair. Uh, I, I, man, you had me scalping clown wig. <laughs> <laughs> getting multicolored <laughs> hair to then put on these children as their little munchkin beards, little green beards and, and they red loved beards. it. Oh, they loved it. We had it. 20 children in that mm -hmm. play besides the 80 some odd members of the cast. It was, it, it was a it huge was, cast. It was like over a hundred people. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. just crazy. You know, it and was so much. We yeah. had, um, we had one of the real munchkins from the wizard of Oz film at opening yes. night uh was margaret yeah. what was her name oh i can't remember she was wonderful to to meet her and talk to her and have her talk to people and yeah it's a memory that is just special i hope it is for everyone because you know they're just not around you know no. i don't think she's alive anymore i think she recently died yeah she autographed so. my vhs copy of the film that was worn down from watching it so you know i as i knew this film i could recite the lines before the actors were off book. <laughs> anyway, all right, all right, all right. We are not here to talk about The Wizard of Oz. We are here to talk about- I know, I could about... go on forever. I know, I know, I know. We're here to talk about <laughs> The Bad Seed. Uh, let's go trick-or-treating. Okay. All right, The Bad Seed, 1956, again, based on a Broadway play. Now, a really neat thing was that the director of this film brought most of the original Broadway cast to the screen. Now, Betty, oh, Davi awesome. Betty Davis was circling. She was actually very interested in playing Christine. And Ooh. while I adore Betty Davis... And I she would was love not to the time, no. No, she's, she's more... Uh, Christine has this naivety to her. Right, this vulnerability yes. and, and this frailty. Yes, because she, yeah, because and that's one of the things that kind of bothered me about her because she just fell apart. I mean, so easily. Yes. I mean, one day you're great, and the next day, what? You're just having a nervous breakdown. You know, yeah. so it went it went pretty quickly. Another really uh, another cool fact I found out: this film was offered to Alfred Hitchcock, and he turned it down. Why? I, I don't know, but I would love to see, you know, this film, the, this movie gets a little bit of criticism. It gets praise and criticism and it's aged very interestingly through the years. Some people consider it camp. And this has been a discussion I've been having a lot lately is people d wrongly identifying camp, right? You can't outright produce camp, in my opinion. Camp is earned. <laughs> camp uh, <laughs> is accidental, right? Yeah, it just happens. It yeah. isn't something that you plan because if you plan it, then it's a production. It's, it's not comedy. Camp. It's not right. Yeah. Yeah, it's comedy. It's, it's it's not. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. Because this film utilized the Broadway cast and the director did not tone down their performances very much for the screen, a they lot of this acting is big. <laughs> it's over it's over the top, but in a really great way because they are all that way. Right. And this film is a mellow, it's a melodrama, really, you know. And so it is. I, it is. I don't dis, I love the performances in this film. I think every single person is remarkable in this movie. 
Well, I can relate to it because I'm such a theater person. So over the top is in my, you know, it's in my lane. So Same. it was okay. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I saw this film. Yeah. This was one that my mom showed me. It must have been on Turner Classic Movies all the time because I must have watched this 50 times with her to the point that we had our little, I would say, I have the nicest mother. I oh, have yeah. the prettiest <laughs> mother. Oh, I've got the prettiest mother. I've got the nicest mother. How, how does that... I tell everyone, yeah. And uh, what would you what would you give me for a basket of kisses? Oh I'd give gosh. you a basket of hugs. Yeah, oh, hugs. Yeah. yeah. I showed it to yeah. Alyssa used to do that to me because I showed it to her, and I yeah. go knock it off, <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. This film was directed by Marvin Leroy. Screenplay by John Lee Martin. Again, based on the play and the book. Uh, cinematography was by Harold Rawson. This was nominated for an Oscar for best cinematography in a black and white film. And that's interesting. It is interesting because it's filmed like a play. The, ex the interior of their home is one. It's like a flat. That's mostly you know? the whole thing. Yes. yes. It is. Yeah. There yeah. aren't a yeah. lot of interesting camera angles. I really only no. noticed a couple that were not just eye level, you know? Right. Uh, and yeah, they don't, they don't leave the set except for her to go outside right. you know a few times and yeah. it's just really yeah it does it does play like a play exactly very much so yeah uh, alex north wrote the score i i do love the score in this film i you know obviously rhoda plays claire de la lune on her piano throughout but they use very <laughs> they use very so creepy oh, dun, 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 dun dun oh my god that's just again and again over oh and get louder and louder and i knew when that scene i just recently watched it again before we were and we be or, i know we we're gonna do this and i knew that scene was coming i knew it i knew it i knew it and i was like oh it's gonna get louder and louder you're gonna drive me crazy and it just it gets creepier and creepier and stop it wrote yeah that's yeah. why you're thinking yeah yeah oh yeah. yeah and the the score uses that variations on that motif throughout you know and kind of makes it distorted at times it's it's very interesting now so let's talk about notable cast right again coming from Broadway. oh i have to say something about the music before you go on just real quick um if you notice in the beginning she couldn't play that very well and then she got by the time she was she did she did leroy yeah <laughs> then yeah then she was great right yeah. no it's it's a it's really cool. clever device to showcase her really getting better at her cunning and her you know her at, her, at her craft at her yes yes, yeah. yes 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 yeah. okay go ahead i had to get that in of course go of ahead. course no so Nan <laughs> nancy kelly as christine Pen this not this film was nominated for four academy awards right nancy kelly as christine patty mccormick as rhoda and eileen heckert as hortense all three nominated. and eileen heck she's a she was an established, established movie actress. You she know, won the stage. Golden Globe for this role. She did not win the Oscar, but she won the Golden Globe. She's wow. incredible. She has 10, 10 minutes of screen time, right? She has, she's only in two only in two scenes. Wow. She was so good. Yes. Yeah. She yes. was so good. I truly believed her. I yes. truly believed her grief. I believed her drunkenness, her pain. Yeah. I just and it just reeked you know just and it just came from her soul it just yeah. did yeah um i read patty mccormick was when she was doing this on broadway right she was eight years old when she played this role on broadway she was 10 when they made the movie playing an eight-year-old she was also on a television show called mama at the time that was also filming in new york now this was a live tv show that from what i read she would go to the set and do mama live at 8 p.m and then rush to the theater to do the bad seed for an 840 curtain, like for an 840 oh my curtain to start the show. Wow. And was never late once. From She would jump in a taxi, put her costume on in the cab, get out and get on stage at eight years old. Well, now that's a pro. That's my Okay. <laughs> uh, we have Hen Henry Jones as Leroy Jessup, Evelyn Varden as Monica Breedlove. Over the top. <laughs> William Hopper as Colonel Kenneth Penmark. If there's one performance I don't love in this movie, it's him as Rhoda's as yeah. Rhoda's dad. Uh, he's just meh. He's well, just, he's not uh, given anything, but I think that's on purpose, right? This movie is about the women for sure. Yeah, 
Yeah. But still, I didn't believe him. No, not at all. Well, and even at the end, we'll get to that later. But, you know, at the end when he should be grief stricken and he's just kind of, I really, really I love my life, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I thought he was the one of the weakest links. Agreed. Agreed. Paul Fix as Richard Bravo, Jesse White as Emery Wages. I love Jesse White, my Maytag man. Maytag washers and dryers are faithful, dependable. That's true of all Maytags. Okay, go ahead. No, so good, so good. <laughs> Gage Clark as Reginald Reggie Tasker, Joan Corden yeah. as Claudia Fern or Miss Fern. I love her. What she's a great prune. Miss. She's like yeah. a little prune. Like she's a prune. <laughs> yes. She's a prune. Yeah. Period. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, Frank Cassidy as Henry Daigle and John C. Uh, Harvey as the guard in the hospital. Very brief scene. Uh, the yeah. movie, like I said, nominated for four Oscars. It was filmed on a budget of about almost $1 million. And that's it, high. It brought in 4.1. Wow. Is, yeah, that's that's a lot. Must have been the salaries because it wasn't anything else. No, there's not a lot of not a lot of set going on or anything. No, or cha- costumes or anything. No. This movie uh, anyway. rocked the world, most notably because of its ending. And we're going to talk about the difference right now between the stage show. No, we're oh, not. Oh, good. No, should we okay. wait? Oh. Why don't we wait until the end? All right. We'll all, right all right. All right. All right. Listeners, all right. <laughs> listeners, you can wait. All right. So why don't we go ahead and get into the plot of the movie? Okay. Opening shot is ominous music over a, a dock at night on kind of a lake. Yep. And, it, you know, panning over this lake and a park next to it and then finishing on this dock. Yep. I mean, you know, okay, this is important. Watch, you know, yeah. Movie opens on a family we have christine and kenneth and rhoda their little girl kenneth is in the military christine is a housewife a housewife she's, uh, a... <laughs> she's a housewife nice she's a housewife yeah yeah and they have a daughter rhoda who is over the top perfect in every single way that smile you that's... learn from the very beginning that smile this movie's not it's hiding just... who the villain is it's called the bad seed you go in knowing that this little girl yeah. is a monster yeah. you know yeah, yeah. um her just... delivery of every line is is so over the top john waters described her performance as oh who was in yankee doodle dandy Jim... <laughs> john jim cap jimmy cagney jimmy so... cagney james cagney <laughs> yeah james, james cagney, cagney. Yeah. so john waters describes this performance as james cagney and pigtails and <laughs> <laughs> i think that's pretty funny as if she's dancing on the she's tapping a gun <laughs> exactly yeah those yeah and when she taps around and and with her shoes her perfect shoes these are all foreshadowing yes. i mean there's so much foreshadowing in that opening scene it's just incredible. Even the opening scene with the dock, right? When they yeah. open with the dock, that is just an amazing thing. Sure. And then we we instantly cut to a bright, happy home, or so we think. Yeah. And or so over the top, happy home. Yes. Our father. With Monica. Yeah. yeah. She's so perfect. She's so wonderful. Oh, you're so lucky. Monica oh is the capital B busybody just up in everybody's business and a self-described uh, amateur therapist or analyst yeah right? she read yes. she read a book on sigmund freud and now she's an expert on everybody <laughs> yes yes it's a later scene we'll get to it yes yeah. it drove me crazy yes i mean she's, just she's just, well intentioned right but god she would get she has a good nerves. heart mm-hmm. oh my god i couldn't handle her just walking in all the time no. and i and I, I, I can't stand people just walking in that apartment all the time. I yeah. mean, what is this? A swing door? I, I mean, know. come on. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, you so... have people walking in your house like that? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm trying to keep people out. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Oh, my so gosh. The know? father of the house, Kenneth, is leaving home on military duty. Now, this would be post-Korean War, right? So I don't know. What... Yes, 56. 56, it was around that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it would be yeah. that time. Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about that because he's leaving his wife and his daughter at home. This is one of the things that I think really scared 1950s audiences was the idea of the man of the house, the father figure leaving? is gone. 
what are these women going to do without the man of the house, right? We have Christine. Poor little women. Yeah, <laughs> right? We have Christine who is, you know, very put together, you know, beautiful, perfect hair, perfect clothing, everything's clean and pressed, a nice collar on her, you know, on her blouse. Uh, right. And it's remarkable to see her fall apart throughout this film. Whether it's yes, a because... good representation of a woman or not, it's an incredible performance of what she's given, you know? Yeah, because her not only is her house clean, but look at Rhoda's Rhoda, how she is dressed. I mean, who dresses this child? Who buys her these clothes? It is Christine yeah. who 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 gives her all these things, you know, and such. And uh, the house, like you said, the apartment is is well taken care of. Everything has a place. You can just see that there's order everywhere and brightly and that lit, is... painted white you know very yeah. open space it should look safe there are some really weird ca- like you know cameos those silhouettes hanging on the wall i noticed one of them is of someone holding a baby like at arm's length it just looks out of place Ooh. compared to yeah compared to the rest of the home but even monica comments you know so monica is their landlady she lives above them right uh she comments when rhoda enters that other children might be looking messy but you know, in her pinafore dress and her perfect blonde pigtails, Rhoda just always looks put together, you know, in a way right. that other kids her age don't. And wouldn't she be worried if she goes out to a picnic? Would she be worried that she would get dirty? No, no, no. You know, right. this is, yeah. I mean, yeah. the thing is, is that as a mom, I wouldn't let my kid wear that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not of wearing course a not. good dress. You're no, not wearing you're going a good to a... dress. Go yeah. get your jeans on or well, your shorts or I something. I think they yeah. even mentioned jeans and how she should be wearing that. And it is it's not a concern with Rhoda because she's so self-sufficient that she would never dream of getting dirty. Rhoda, part of what makes her so um cunning is that she is so perfectly put together, right? That's how yes. she that's how she sneaks and gets to you, almost like an animal in camouflage, right? She stalks. Yeah. She stalks. She thinks. She's, she's, and that's really creepy for a child. I mean, looking at you, you know that they are stalking you and thinking ahead. And yet I think she is very naive. And we'll talk about that when you get to the other scenes. Well, yeah. She's agreed, very because naive. She, does, she thinks that she's smarter than everybody. And perhaps she is smarter than a lot of people, but there's especially one character in this film that she's not smarter than. She, he is just on the same level with her. We'll talk about that when we get there. So yeah, a lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot happens in this opening scene real fast. Um, she is, uh, Monica, the landlord, gives Rhoda a pair of sunglasses to shade her beautiful eyes and the, you know, the rhinestones to frame them. And she also <laughs> gives her a necklace that has a birthstone in it. And Monica remarks, I will take this necklace and I will have this birthstone removed and yours put in. And Rhoda says, well, can't I have both of them? And her mother says, Rhoda, what is wrong with you? And Monica says, no worries. She deserves both stones. I'll just go have hers added. You know, that's chutzpah. That's, That's just chutzpah. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you, it's just chutzpah. What child? I mean, I would just be mortified if my if my child said that. Yeah, you know, I would not be happy asking for more than what was given to you. Yes. You know, that's right. just not a good lesson. No. And they accept it. That's what. That's part of yeah. it too. Is the acceptance of her always asking or you know getting her way always. And nothing is ever said. There's no pulling back. None. You know, there really yeah. isn't. There's no consequences. There is. There are no consequences. None. And I think that that yeah. is. I'm not going to keep saying that Christine is a character. She is a character with flaws, but she is supposed to be right. So that's the last time I'm going to say it. You know, Christine. I think turns her head a lot at Rhoda's uh, misbehavior. It's her only child, mm-hmm. and she is not sure of herself in many right. ways. I think she has doubts about herself. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of people do. And I think as the movie goes on, we see more and more, but, but I think that, that these doubts um, tear her apart, you know? And I think that even though she was loved as a child, she still has so much to overcome. It feels, it feels like she just, she is needy. I, I just think Christine is a needy 
woman. Yes. Yeah. And um, for all her strengths, you know, so, yeah. yeah. No, that's a great, that's a great read of the character. Now, as you mentioned, Rhoda's shoes make a sound when she taps her heel or when she walks, her heels have these little metal taps on them. So we are introduced to Leroy, who is the groundskeeper for this apartment building. And Leroy is simple-minded, right? Yes. And has no boundaries. None. That's a great point. And who comes in, who comes in the house and empties garbage for people? Right. Come on. Right. You know, I mean, just no boundaries whatsoever. So it's very apparent. Two things are very apparent. He is a simple minded and B detests Rhoda. Like yes, to a point that wants to pick on her. Now the the movie never goes here. The uh, I'm assuming the play didn't either. The novel at one point mentions him having a creepy eye on her, like an inappropriate eye on her. It only mentions it once, and it, it it's kind of fleeting and gone. But it's there in the book. The movie does not harp you know harp on that at mm-hmm. all. Uh, yeah. He, you know, Monica mentions, does he always just walk in here? You know, he shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. And Christine yeah. dismisses it and says, no, oh, it's fine. He's just Leroy. And Monica says, you know, being as simple as he is, he does. He has managed to produce a family. And that's the only reason that I keep him employed. As they are leaving to go to the picnic, he's watering the grass and he sprays Rhoda's shoes with the hose. And that's like a kid. That's yes. just like a kid. Yeah. I mean, I could see my kids doing that when they were little. Yeah. yeah. He does it on purpose. He is probably at the same mentality as one of Rhoda's classmates, right? In yeah. the, way that, the way that he reasons and the way that he thinks. But I think that he is just as smart as Rhoda when it comes to, I mean, he's the only one who's going to figure out, he's the first one that figures out yeah. what's going on, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. And he, yeah. fa- and he falls into it. Yes. You know, he doesn't. Well, yeah. That's the thing. He, and he's it... still not smart enough to escape her, right? Yeah, yeah. So Christine takes Rhoda to the picnic, and she takes this moment to talk to Miss Fern, Rhoda's teacher, who's setting up, you know, for lunch. And she gives her the check for the next quarter of the school year, and she says, "Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to talk to you about my daughter." Now, like you said, Miss Fern is very much a prude. Uh, she's very reserved. She's very cold oof, to Christine. She is. From I don't know how start. she can be ahead of a school. I mean, yeah. I don't think of, yeah. Well, I have to Ooh. think that she is this way with Christine specifically because she can sense she she is with Rhoda all day, you know, and I think that she can observe that Rhoda is not a nice little girl, you know. Or there's something off about her. Yeah. 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 And Christine I, I just to- think her guard is up. Her guard yeah. is up around Rhoda. Yeah. Christine tries to get out of her, you know, is Rhoda doing okay with the other children? Is she popular? Yeah. And uh, Miss Fern is kind of almost placating her and just saying, she never says yes. She says, well, Rhoda's very good in all of her studies. And, you know, Rhoda, yeah. she never says- She that- deflects her. She totally yeah. deflects. Yeah. yeah. Now we've also learned that there was a penmanship competition and yep. Rhoda- wanted to win this it was the only gold medal that miss fern gives out the entire school year is for penmanship and rhoda lost it to claude daigle daigle in the book it is the award is for most improved penmanship it's changed in the play in the film to strictly penmanship which i think is very interesting because in the movie if it's just penmanship then she might have deserved to win it if it's most improved, she probably had perfect penmanship to begin with, which would mean that she didn't deserve, you know, Claude might've really had the most improved penmanship. Do you know what I think? The reason why Claude got the medal is because, and teachers will do this, because it, it would benefit him so much more to have that boost, you know? And because Rhoda was already you know, succeeding, succeeding (laughs) in so many ways and a strong, strong little girl where Claude was doubting himself and didn't know if he fit in and, you know, just struggling. This was a real boost. I mean, as a former teacher, I could see, I really could see doing that. Yeah. You know, I, it's interesting you bring that up. So I do talk about queer themes in my, in the movies that I talk about when it's appropriate. And I have to say this movie 
the gays really love to quote this movie. <laughs> and it had, me, it had me thinking, what is it about this movie, you know, that the, the gays just flock to? And I think there is that element of it has become a little camp over the years. But I also, the more I thought about it, this movie is about nature versus nurture. And for many years, that was the debate over making someone gay. Are you born this way or do you become gay? You know, my mother thought that maybe she right. was a little too close with her kids and that's what turned us gay. And obviously that wasn't it, you know? But I think that the, the constant debate of nature versus nurture in this film really kind of draws um, a lot of us. We also just really love a sassy, biting, evil queen, you know, like Rhoda. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when it comes to Claude, I, I did kind of remark to my head and, you know, half jokingly that there's a moment where Hortense, his mom says that, you know, I'm never going to, he told her, I'm never going to marry another girl. I'm never going to find yeah. anyone prettier than you. So we know he's a mama's boy and he's got nice handwriting. This kid was probably a little fruity. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I, when, when that line was read, you know, when I, when I was read, when I read it and when I also heard it in the movie, yeah, I thought the same thing. Did you really? I did. Oh, I did. Yeah, I did yeah. because, because he's, yeah. I thought him as a frail, frail, um, shy little boy. Yes. You know, that yeah. wouldn't hurt anyone that loved his mother, um, more than anything and was close to her. And, um, yeah, I, I just saw him as, as that character, you know, yeah. as just, yeah, as the beginning of someone who who might have, you know, gay tendency, you know, be gay. Absolutely. Don't know, don't yeah. know, but but could be, yeah. But not 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 just because he loves his mother, but because of just the way they portrayed him and how much. Because boys, who would care about, <laughs> sure. you know, who would really right. care about a penmanship medal that much at at eight, I think of eight-year-old boys. No, I don't think so. They're roughhousing and going out for sports and doing right. all this, right? I mean, yeah. penmanship, right? you know, is that important? Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I don't <laughs> now, know. Maybe I... <laughs> I, well, I'm glad. I love that we both kind of had the same thought on that because I thought I was reaching, but if I'm not, then that's great. <laughs> no, I thought of it too. I thought of it too. I think he's, yeah, I think he's a sweet little boy. I think it's also worth noting that at no point uh, Rhoda is not concerned with having the best penmanship. It's almost like she knows that already. She wants oh, the yeah, she metal, wants that. right? Yeah. She she wants this physical thing that tells her that she's the best. It she hasn't. It, it's yep. You know that's certainly worth noting. Uh, it's a trophy. It's yes. it's a trophy. And mm, although I'm not as savvy as you about horror movies and such, but um, most. A lot of characters in horror movies like to have trophies. That's a great point. Yeah. No, that's a really great point, right? And as we find yeah. out later, she's been collecting these trophies. Yes. And plans yes. to so. continue doing that. <laughs> uh, yes, right, so, yes. Uh, we are back home and Christine is having some guests over. Now, these are a couple of true crime writers who uh, I guess maybe friends of the, the, maybe just friends of her and Kenneth and they're having lunch. And Monica is with them. And Monica's taking this opportunity to show off her, you know, ability. Now this to is, be I, a... I think the, I think the guy is Monica's friend and she invites him. Is that it? She? Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I think no, that, so. And, that and that's out. how the connection grew because Monica said so-and-so and then, and then Christine latched on to him. Yes. Yes. Because he does come back. And we, uh, you know, Monica takes this moment to start psychoanalyzing everybody. She, She's just so full of shit. Pardon my <laughs> language. No, she is. Uh, you know, she is. She, uh, she says something like, you know, well, my therapist told me that my my marriage with my husband ended because our last name was Breedlove. And I wanted the last syllable <laughs> of this name, but he was only interested in the first syllable, which is a body, <laughs> a body thing for her to say in 1956. 1956, don't you think? <laughs> yes. No, it was. It was. But it's and, like, and, and the idea of her saying, Say the first thing that comes into your mind. No, now say the first thing. I mean, that was such a a thing. Well, and let's know, talk about her. that, right? She tells Christine, just tell me the, you know, let's let's play. Let's let me practice. Tell me the first thing that comes Whoa. to your mind. And Christine opens up and she says, Okay, you know, since I was a little girl, I've always had this fantasy or this feeling that I was adopted. And Monica immediately dismisses oh, that. It's like a leech. Wait a minute, it's like a leech, though. She does. 
she does get into that with her dreams though well, she so. tells her she tells her the the changeling fantasy is normal for children and then she brings it back to herself i thought i was a fairy princess right it's like <laughs> tell me your first thought so i can tell you that you're being you silly. mine yeah and i'll tell you mine and, and mine are more me. important exactly. yes yeah yes yes but i thought it was weird that um that christine would tell her such a deep what she's never admitted that to anyone never yeah and now she does right what is that well, <laughs> i know a lot, it's a play or a movie a lot but of i know i mean there's a lot of conveniences for sure because the uh the men are talking about female serial killers and the name Bessie Denker comes up. Yes. And, you know, a little bit of the start of the conversation about nature versus nurture. Are people born killers or, you know, are they developed like in the musical Wicked? Are people born wicked or do they have wickedness yes. thrust upon them? But as you know, <laughs> Christine seems to recognize this name, Bessie Denker. And, you know, she's uh, Christine's delivery. It rings lines, a bell. It rings a bell. Yeah. And she has this way of speaking through her breath that produces this metallic sound of despair that is just it's a <laughs> very interesting tone of voice that she's able to to take advantage of you know for this character but as soon as she recognizes this name the voice on the radio makes an announcement and says there's been an accident with the fern school at their picnic and you know a little child has drowned and christine's yes reaction is incredible you know and she says yes. i just know it was rhoda and monica grabs her and says no it wasn't rhoda she's too self-sufficient she's too smart of a little girl to let that happen and to that's her. true yeah and that is true yeah and thank god for monica at that point that was right. the right reaction yeah you know, she's a pain in the ass you, but she's a good friend yeah you don't worry until it's time no yeah. she has a good heart even though she is over the top and you know a little self-centered yeah she yeah. does have a good heart there's an incredible moment where Christine is standing up and she's just, you know, wretched with fear. And, you know, that this was her daughter. And then they announced that the person who drowned was a little boy named Claude Daigle. And you see the relief. Yes. That it's not her daughter. And then you see the realization that a child was killed. And it's just this yes. great. You know, when people say it's over the top, the acting is over the top. I think that that, that allows them to express a lot of things that are unsaid in the script. Yes. Yes, because that's what people would feel. Yeah. You know, you would you would go through that process. Thank God it's not my own. Oh, wait, it's another child and yeah. another mother. And yes. Yeah. And so you then because we are every man, you know, yeah. we always uh, will be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This movie, I think, so. showcases some things that other movies at the time did not, including a reaction like that. You know, obviously the killer child and you know, this was maybe the first that ever showcased that. But there's also just little things that this movie plays on that I don't think other movies were were maybe diving into as much as this one does. So the announcer who, if I'm not mistaken, the voice of the announcer is the same actor who plays Leroy. Ah! Which is probably a carryover from the stage production, because if he's off stage at that point, he's probably in the wings delivering these lines, right? Doing the lines, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, announces that the children are being sent home. And right, Chris, Christine right. says, oh, what do I do? How do I talk to my daughter about this grief? She says, I had a teacher who passed away and it changed my whole world. It was the first time she thought about death. And Monica, for being such a busybody and wanting to be in everybody's business at all times, tells her, I can't help you here. This is between you and your daughter. I know. And I thought that was really strange <laughs> yes. to say. Yeah. I thought, come on, where's Freud when you need him? Come on. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this woman is ill-equipped for anything. She doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> I just thought, what? What? What friend would say that? We really learned you, that this is right. You would want to be there. You would there. really say, yeah, you would you would say. You'll do fine. The words will come. You'll know what to say when it's time. You'll be okay. And, you know, you'll work through it. Anything positive and encouraging, but nothing. I have nothing to say. But Goodbye. I think this movie, <laughs> this movie has a lot of blurring the lines between familiarity and how close do you let people get to the real you? Like, we'll get to that when we talk about Hortense coming in drunk. Sure. Right. And, and the, her react, her, well, We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Uh, okay. I do want to mention they did they did talk about an incinerator in the building where Leroy burns the trash. And we'll come back to We're that. Shadowing. It's, it's kind of Chekhov's incinerator, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is again 
foreshadowing. Yeah. I mean, they introduce all these things. Yeah. They do. They can there's there's a brief mention about Kenneth keeping a gun in the house as well that is so quick if you blink you miss it, but uh, right. that's that's literally right. Chekhov's gun <laughs> for sure. <laughs> all right, so Rhoda comes home and she's perfectly she's fine. fine. Yeah. I mean, skipping happy, you know, she, yeah. the first thing she says to her mother, you know, her mother says, how are you? And she says something like, Oh, everything, everyone was having so much fun at the picnic until Claude Daigle was drowned. And it just Ugh. so matter of fact, and I, it's, it was, it was creepy. Yeah. What, what child would do that really? And what mother would accept mm -hmm. that reaction and let it go. I'm right. sorry. It's maybe, maybe today because People would say, okay, and they'd let them feel what they feel. But back then, no, 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 no. they would, no, not in the 50s. No. no. <laughs> right. Never would happen. Never. She asked her mother for a peanut butter sandwich. And I know, of all things. She says, <laughs> she's, is this where she starts playing? Oh, you know what? She was playing the piano earlier uh, when her dad was leaving and she was playing Claire de la Lune poorly. Yes. Uh, and yes. so, but now she gets home, everything's fine, asks for a peanut butter sandwich and says, may I, may I go roller skating while I finish my sandwich? I'd like to. And her mom says, well, then you should. And it's very sugary. There's so much saccharin. The first act, it, it's funny to see the sugar melt, you know? <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. And I have to say those skates brought back so many memories to me. I have my skate key. I have my skate key. I saw her putting those skate keys on and I, I knew you were going to say that, Esther. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't keep my skates because they rusted. I kept them for years and years and years oh. and they were so heavy. Yeah. And because I used to skate like that, but I kept my skate key. Wow. I definitely have mine in my, in my little memory box, what you know, because I know who has that anymore. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that's, and people don't even understand you had to tighten it mm -hmm. around your shoes. It was yeah. just so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, and worth it. And it oftentimes fell off and you'd fall and there was no stopping. Oh and my Oh God. my God. Yeah. It was R wrist oh, pads and knees. elbow pads and knee pads were not a thing at the time. <laughs> no, I scraped my knees more times than I can tell you when I was a little girl in New York. Yeah. yeah growing up. Oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Anyway, uh, so she's <laughs> sitting on the steps, putting on her skates and Leroy is gardening and he comes over and, you know, he says, you, you should be more grief stricken about this little boy's death. What's wrong with you? And and she's like, I, why should I be bothered? It was Claude Daigle who drowned, not Daigle me. Daigle died. Yeah. 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 yeah that and, was, uh, they're, that they're, was a sign. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, they're, they're head to heads are so good just great writing great acting you know he he wants to get under her skin and he, he doesn't even suspect anything yet not even at all no. he just wants and to he's her on off. her level physically too which yes I he's thought crouched was down mm -hmm. yeah and i thought that was and even a little bit lower than she is yes this time when he's what he was doing and i thought that was interesting too yeah you know yeah it was the, the angles so yep while you know what before she has gone outside miss fern the school teacher shows up and i i just love rhoda's delivery of hello miss fern it's and she curtsies <laughs> god she's so curtsy. oh my god <laughs> oh she should have won an oscar just for the curtsy alone <laughs> it was a perfect curtsy oh my gosh who curtsies <laughs> who curtsies literally nobody <laughs> i mean i remember when i was a little girl in new york and i went to public school we had to wear, we had to have, we had to wear dresses like Rhoda wore, you know, every day we didn't wear pants and we had to have pinned with a safety pin to our waist. We had to come to school with it, a hanky, a cloth hanky every day. For what? In case we sneezed, in case oh, we needed wow. a handkerchief. Yeah. We always, our, that's a memory I have. I had, Interesting. yeah. Yeah. I thought, where's your hanky, Rhoda? You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can curse me. You better have a hanky attached to that dress, I'm too. You know, I can guarantee she has one tucked away somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so Miss Fern is here and she's, again, very, very cold to Christine. And 
Christine has just seen her daughter act, frankly, like a sociopath about this. So but she, she doesn't know. Right. Yeah, no, she she doesn't know, know, but she's distracted and she's starting to suspect. She she's she just she's confused perhaps by that reaction that her daughter had. Uh Ms. and confused by the reaction Miss Fern has to her too, because she again back in the day, what a teacher thought was like God. Yes, you know, you didn't exactly. question it. It's changed over the years. Right. But it yeah, but it was like written in gold letters that this is what you think, then it must be so. So she that I think also added to her confusion too. Christine asked that a she teacher. Says, yeah. And she says, I can only imagine that you'll be putting together a collection for some sort of floral wreath for the funeral. How can I contribute? And Miss Fern says, Oh, well, we just thought that you'd probably want to send your own flower. And that was strange. Yeah. That was strange. Yeah. Why would she say that? I don't even that had no I mean, that was like out of nowhere. Yeah. Then then you must think there was some hanky panky and you must think that Rhoda had something to do with it. You yes. must. Yeah. And and so Christine kind of presses the issue and, and Miss Fern says it's it's by many accounts who were pe people who were there, including my own, that Rhoda was the last person that Claude Daigle right. was with before he died. And, you know, that she was trying to snatch this medal away from him and chasing him around and trying to get the medal. And, you know, Christine's beside herself and, you know, Rhoda wouldn't do that. And it, the, conversation gets, <laughs> the conversation gets heated, you know, and yes. uh, it, yes. it ends, it, it climaxes with Christine saying, I don't think that, you know, that we need to be sending Rhoda back to your school. Yeah. And and Miss Fern says, well, I don't think she'll be welcome back at the school. And then right when they're at their tete-a-tete -tete with this, Mrs. Daigle walks in and followed by her husband and mm -hmm. she's man this scene both of her scenes are so good i mean it's so good well done drunk scene i've never done one yes. as an actor before i've played drunk i was simon stimson in our town a million years ago <laughs> and, you know but yes. the, he's drunk but it's not a drunk scene and uh, you know i think it's hard to play drunk convincingly it is it is it's really hard because you have to be loose mm -hmm. and um yet clear in what you want to say and you don't have to be the sloppy, sloppy drunk, but you still have to give that appearance that your mind is, you know, taken over by, um, it's just looser, you know, loose yeah. lips, you know, tell no lies. And she's just really telling what she feels and sharing what she feels. And I think that's just monumental in this, to hear her grief like that, to hear her one second talking about, you know, one aspect and then totally crashing into the depths of despair. You yes. know, that is just, yeah. 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 She's almost like an animal, like an animal has walked into the room because you can't predict what she's going to do next. She changes tone. She changes intention with the snap of a finger, you know? And she's kind to Christine. She's so I kind mean, to Christine. She... And she feels sorry for her. I feel like she really feels sorry for her. Yeah, you know, you know and, she's, and she's, she's come been... because she's heard that Rhoda was the last person to have, you know, to have seen her boy. And and she, it, there's also her appearance. Her she's her blouse is kind of untucked from her skirt. You can see her bra through her white blouse. You know, she it's clear that she does not have as much money as Christine and she comments she doesn't have that cameo on see, no, in those days yeah. used to wear cameos to cover that and and she doesn't have the cameo on no no she even comments you know she sits down and she says Christine you can wear such simple things I could never wear them even when if I bought them I'd get them home and they didn't look simple anymore and she really puts herself down you know Christine what a beautiful name my name's Hortense it sounds fat and then gives this really like cruel rhyme that the kids used to make fun of her with where you know writing the name writing her name on the privy wall and you know she's very she said it's complete. a terrible name yes it is <laughs> I mean, yes, it's it a is. terrible name and kids would be so cruel i of mean of course they would could you imagine kids today i mean with that name oh no. god no, no. Uh, but she's terrible kind of, name. kind of the exact opposite of christine right christine is yes. pulled together at all times and but, you know, kind and, and Hortense is just in, in grief. And if there's a moment, you know, she, she's implying that 
Miss Fern, who's still in the room, knows something that she won't tell her, right? And she's she just wants answers. And maybe I can talk to Rhoda. You she know. does not trust Miss Fern. No, at she all. does not. And she, I love. Yeah. Oh, I love when she just looks at you know. So she works as a, she works at a beauty parlor, and she looks at Christine, and she just goes, "Miss Fern dyes her hair." I know. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Fern is just beside herself, clutching her pearls. My secret's out, you know. <laughs> oh God, that was a funny scene. That was funny. That that was yeah. It, this that was this, ballsy. That was just ballsy to her to say that. This moment is very different from her second appearance in Act Two, right? Because Christine pities her, and does, she wants her out of her house, not in like a malicious way but just uh you know i don't want rhoda to she's see pro- this she's protecting rhoda yes yes yeah, because she, she knows that she knows that hortense wants to wants to talk to her and question her and um and i also think christine knows somewhere in her in her heart that rhoda's not going to give her what she needs and no. that could that yeah and so that will be even worse yeah so she's yeah she's pulling the mama card to get her out yeah, she wants her out, She's which is very thing. sad. And I, I really think Hortense was was probably a wonderful mother. Oh yeah, as oh, absolutely. just loving and kind, and yeah, yeah. Well, it's just there's a heartbreaking amazing. moment where she she motions to her husband, who's just meek and and small, and he's really just he's letting her get this out. You know, like what are you gonna do to stop her? And um, and she says, you know, that's Emery. He married late. I wasn't a spring chicken. And then her heart breaks and you see it in her face. And she says, we won't have any more children. And it's just like, oh my God, you know, you're, this is all that you had. You loved your kids so much. This is when she says, you know, I told him he would marry a girl. And he said, no, mommy, I'll never find anyone as pretty as you. And you, yeah, I want to grow up and marry you. And um, just her, her voice work as an actor is so good in this scene, just dropping an octave when she, when she needs to, you know? It, it, it tugged at my heart. It always did that, that scene because losing a child, you know, it's just the depths, you know? So whenever anybody talks about losing a child, no matter what the age is, it's just, there's no other, um, there's just nothing that you can compare it to. No, It just chops you in half, you know, you're no longer whole. And so I felt that with her performance. I felt like, like she is just drowning, just drowning. And she will be drowning for months and months to come, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just, it just broke my heart. Yeah. You know, it did. And I, I was so so proud of the husband who was standing beside her even though he didn't do anything he was even he was very melba toast to me he was like a little piece of melba toast but he was still strong enough to know what to do for her to allow her to allow her these moments to get this out you know and and just to be there just to stand beside her and so many people don't know what to do in grief, you know, and such. And those first days are like, you're in a fog. You're, yeah. you're just, well, months and months, you're in a fog. And so, yeah, it just broke my heart. She was, she, she showed the depths of despair of losing yes. a child. She did. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, gets to a point where it's time to leave. Oh, when Emery says it's time to go home and she breaks and she just cries and says home. home. Oh, it's so sad. And, uh, you know, she uh, honor, she's trying to be kind to Christine. She is kind to Christine, you know, keeps inferring, you know, pointing at Miss, Miss Fern shows her, uh, inferring that Miss Fern knows something that she won't tell. And she tells yes. Christine, why don't you come to my beauty parlor? I won't, you know, you're looking a little disheveled. It won't cost you a thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm as drunk as I can be and will just slinks out just like, I mean, just almost slithers out of that house, you know, but not in like a, in just a sad, sad way. And I agree. And the way she says the word home tore me up yeah. because, because the memories of home, you don't want to go home no. because you don't want to face that. So yeah, it, it, it's just heartbreaking. 
totally is. heartbreaking. And and again, that word, she said it. She gave that emotion. Mean, it was amazing. Yeah. You got it. I'm certain on the Broadway production, she received applause after her exit in this scene and in her second, her scene in the second act, you know? I mean, she'd have to. I would How imagine. Would not? I don't know if people would applaud, though, with her being so sad. I think, you know what I mean? I think people would be crying. Sure. Well, I don't certainly know. then, at least at Curtain Call, getting oh, for sure. a oh, mass for sure. amount of applause. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Standing so up. she's gone. And mm. Monica <laughs> tells Christine... Uh, where is that necklace that I gave Rhoda? I want to go ahead and have that rhinestone put on. So Christine, you know, she's still beside herself. I mean, Christine does not get a chance to catch her breath in this movie. She starts drowning. No. And she's just sinking lower and lower, you know? So you see her unwind and she's, you know, she's nothing can help that poor woman. And sure, let me, um, let me go get this. And so she goes into Rhoda's room, opens up her little treasure chest, her little jewelry box and gets the necklace, but then notices under the lining, the lining is pulled up and she pulls up the lining and she pulls the penmanship medal out of her treasure chest. Can you imagine? And uh, yeah, it's like a dagger, like yeah. a dagger, you know, just... gives, gives the necklace to Monica, Monica leaves and Rhoda comes in and what is she sits her down on the couch and she i love the look she looks at rhoda without blinking straight in the eyes and she takes the medal in her palm and she slaps it down on the table and she says that's the first time we see anger any any sort of a scrap of anger or discipline right yes yes what was claude daigle's penmanship medal doing in your treasure chest and rhoda says oh he gave it to me he told me i could hold on to it for an hour and Christine's not buying it. It's the first yeah. time that she suspects that her daughter's full of shit, you know? And she's an adroit liar, yes. <laughs> yeah, she's, be she's beside herself and she doesn't, she doesn't know what to do. It, it, she doesn't do anything though at this point, right? She's not fully aware. She's, she's just, you know, we have- Well, to she demands the truth. Yeah. She's demanding. She wants the truth. She demands it. And her anger is still simmering. <laughs> You know, and she doesn't put up with any of the, oh, mommy, I have the best mommy and the whole, you know, all that stuff. She doesn't put up with it. Well, and at then all. She, she says, we're going to, we have to give this to Mrs. Daigle. And Rhoda refuses and gets very upset about it. And we learn that when they lived in Wichita, because it's a military family, they move around a lot. When we lived in Wichita, Rhoda uh, had a neighbor who was an older woman who had promised her a crystal ball, right? who um, mm -hmm. that when uh, she had promised to have it, give it to her when she died. And then this woman slipped down the stairs and fell. And now Rhoda has that crystal ball on her treasure chest. Right. And Christine suspects right now. a little bit. Well, later, it's a foreshadowing. Yeah. It's of like, course. I mean, hmm, 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 hmm. you know, go check that treasure box, Christine right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what else has she got in there? So Christine's father, Richard visits and, you know, he's going to hang out and have dinner and they're having drinks and they have a conversation and Christine starts inferring, you know, I, I'm curious about writing a, a book, you know, like you do. Uh, 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 do you think that, <laughs> do you think that this is like a really <laughs> silly way to try to cover up what you're yes. trying to get at? Uh, yes. Do you think that people are born murderers or do you think that, you know, they're created that way? And he, he flat out without even a second thought says, no, it's ridiculous. It's nurture. You know, no one's born evil, which we know is hereditary, not true hereditary versus environment. Yes. Is what they say. Yeah. yeah, I wrote yeah. that down because I thought, yeah, yeah. He's staunchly against yeah. the very idea that anyone can yes. And, you know, we find out later why he has decided this for himself. And she brings up the idea that she always felt adopt like she was adopted. And he is, you know, he's, it's a great scene where she's trying to tell this story and he's trying not to hear it. And you know she says deny oh. deny deny mm -hmm. yes that's i thought what a scene i i didn't understand this great man who she adores right had not told her before 
Sure. You know, I, I people who are adopted usually find out at some I, point in their life. I think it is because so, you know, she mentions the name Bessie, Bessie Denker and he says, you remember that name? And we learned that, yeah, he when Bessie Denker yeah. was ex- executed, he adopted her. And I think his um, th- his refusal to ever tell her this is that the movie really plays on kind of good breeding. Right. The idea of this nuclear fam, this nuclear white American family in the 50s comes from this lineage of well-bred, upright standing American citizens, including yep. her father, who is, you know, a, a known author. A well-known, yeah. well-respected, loving, caring, the whole thing. And Where so is her mother? Where the, is her mother? That I don't know. She must that have That bothered me. Yeah, she might have Maybe passed. Maybe she passed, yeah. but I just thought, hmm. Um, yeah. But so, you know, the this idea that was so rampant in the 50s that I mean, it's a it would be a fear then of kind of dirtying the bloodline. Right. And so I think maybe that's why he never would have told her it's for appearances. Uh, and, you know, and this idea, of I always thought shame on him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Shame on him. Here's this woman who's thinking about this, recalling things, help her out. You're you're a smart man, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah I just... Christine yeah. starts to unravel and <laughs> uh, in front of him, and he says, you know, what's happening? And he suspects it might be something to do with Rhoda, and she, you know, she won't openly say it. If, if, if one person would just have a conversation, an honest conversation with somebody else in this movie, we might have saved a lot of trouble. <laughs> no, well, there wouldn't be a movie. There wouldn't be a movie. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so. he says, no, there's no way Rhoda, you know, it's, it's, it's not nature. It is nurture. You have raised her in a good home. I raised you in a good home and you're fine. Rhoda comes in, says hello to her grandfather. And I believe this might be when she got a package from her dad and it's a tea set. So they unwrap it. He gives her a big old hug. I think they do the whole, you know, what would you give me for a basket of kisses? I'd give you a basket oh. of hugs thing. She did it with her dad earlier. And he yes. holds her close and he lifts her up and he looks her directly in the eyes and he's looking for it, right? He's looking right. and for such a movie with big, broad performances, I love his moment because you can't really tell what he sees but i think he sees something you think he does i think i don't think i don't think he did i think i don't think he uh, did i think he i think he was in denial i i don't think he did until the end i no. think if he saw it he did shoved it away he shoved it because away he, because then it would mean that it was given by his daughter well, and he given, couldn't handle being, you know, a, being a true crime expert as as a writer you know, I don't know. It, it It's another theme of this movie of, of, you know, blinding yourself to the truth of someone. And he, I think he did. Yeah, yeah, I think he totally did because it's the only way he could survive because of what he did to, you know, how he got Christine. Right. You know, and such. I, I don't think he would ever admit that that could be a possibility admit out loud not out loud and maybe not even admit to himself well on his way out the door he looks he gives christine a look and he subtly shakes his head no you know and he's like not our rhoda rhoda's fine yeah don't don't be worried um but obviously that's not going to be enough so later that well i what bugs me is that christine is weepy and crying and just you know he's does why doesn't he help her more? Why does he leave so soon? Yeah. Why doesn't he stick around and help her gather herself? Yeah. People just leave her in this wake of of spiraling. Spiral anyway. <laughs> spiraling <Yes. laughs> downward. I, I don't understand why someone didn't say stop. Stop, stop. Well, then it wouldn't be a movie too. But right. still, it's just crazy. I have a hard time. I have a hard time with this man who she adores and was the best daddy in the whole wide world. Yeah. Well, then be the best daddy in the whole wide world and, and help her. Yeah. I don't know. You know, and Monica too. She didn't help her. No. So. No. Not at all. 
it's a lot of leaving Christine to fend for herself. And she's just ill-equipped for anything that's, I mean, who is equipped to deal with anything that's thrown at her? Finding out she was adopted, finding out her mother was a serial killer, finding out a little boy at the school was killed, finding out that your daughter, you know, is could, could have had something to do with yeah, it. Yeah, could point. be the not, killer. Yeah. Not confirmed yet. Right. You know? But you have strong feelings that it yeah. could be. So, and strong feelings about others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the whole thing. Yeah. But you said it first is finding out she was adopted. Okay. That's <laughs> <laughs> many people going to therapy for years about that. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, that alone would just be something to stop. You know, she needs help. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that night, oh. uh, she wrote is sneaking around and. Uh, Christine sees her putting something into the chute that leads down to the incinerator to kind of burn trash, right? Which is another interesting thing. They have this trash chute in their apartment. What was the Roy doing in the first place emptying their trash cans? I this know. is something they're perfectly capable of doing themselves. It's just I to know. let us know I, that there's I, an incinerator, right? Yeah. So Christine stops her and says, what are you putting in the incinerator right now? And Rhoda tries to convince her, oh, it's just the Excelsior that my tea set was packed in from daddy. And I'm just trying to burn the trash, but she's hiding these shoes behind her back. And Christine makes her show them to her. Is that the incinerator? Yes. Well, what is it? It's just some things you told oh, me. Throw it's away. It's no! No! And she sees the shoes and she notices these crescent shaped crescent. metal taps on the heels and says they found crescent shaped marks on the boy's hands and face when they pulled him out of the water and they couldn't explain what yep. they were. Rhoda, what did you do with these shoes? And this, the scene, this is our act one finale, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have an incredible performance where she admits that you know, he, he wouldn't give me the medal and I deserved it. And I told him, you give me the medal and he wouldn't give it to me. And she starts shouting and she says, so I push a clench this tantrum. Oh my God. You see her fury. Yeah. And with the shoes, didn't you? And with the shoes, that's how he got those half moon marks on his forehead and on his hands. Answer me, Rhoda. Answer me. I hit him with the shoes. I had to hit him with the shoes. What else could I but do? Do you realize that you murdered him? But it was his fault. If he gave me the medal like I told him to, I wouldn't have hit him. You see all the <laughs> levels of her emotion from that fury and then her, you know, saying, what could else could I do? I mean, she just changed. And it was just like this roller coaster of going to the extreme high of, you know, like, I, I do, it, you know, and banging on the couch and, and then to the, to the softness of it all. It was just amazing. <laughs> We're going to start at the beginning and you're going to tell me the truth. <laughs> now, I know you killed him, so there's no sense lying. Rona, I want you to tell me the truth. I can't tell you, Rona, I can't. Tell you. Rona, I can't tell you. I'm waiting for your answer. It's a mind-blowing performance from from such a young person, you know, eight yes. years old on Broadway, ten years old when she filmed it, playing an eight-year-old. It's it's just and doing it every night, I'm doing Come it on. every night. How? Come on. <laughs> I know. I know. <sighs> he wouldn't give me the medal like I told him to. That's all. So then he ran away from me and hid on the wharf. But I found him there, and I told him I did it with my shoe. If he didn't give me the medal. But he shook his head and said no. So I hit him the first time. Then he took off the medal and gave it to me. And then what happened? He tried to run away from me. So I hit him with my shoe again! But he kept on crying and making a noise. And I was afraid somebody would hear him, so I kept on hitting a mother! I hit him harder that time. He fell in the water. Oh my God, my God. <laughs> well, I, I would love to know her audition for this and, and where, you know, what that was like. And, and it's, 
Yeah. Probably a very, yeah. I'm Why sure she's Castor? probably talked about it in an interview somewhere. She went on to be, they did, they remade the movie a few years ago and it was not good. It was a made for TV movie. And she, she makes an appearance as like a psychologist in it or something, but. Anyway. And she had a career. Oh, you know, yeah. She did have a movie career, but she never, never was known for anything like she was for this. She was in a horror movie in the 90s called Mother, where she basically plays Rhoda Penmark as an adult. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, all right. So, oh. uh, you know, the 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 shoes. And she she says, he. I pushed him in the water, and then he tried to come out, so I hit him on the hands. And, you know, I couldn't let him out oh. of the water, Mama. He was going to tell on me, and then they'd hurt me. And Oh, I've got the prettiest mother I've got the nicest mother. How, how, did the, how did the marks get on the backs of his hands? He tried to pull himself back in the wharf after he fell in the water. I wouldn't have hit him anymore. Only he kept saying he was going to tell on me. Oh, Mommy, Mommy, please say you won't let them hurt me. I won't let them hurt you. I don't know what must be done now, but I promise you nobody will hurt you. Everything is very self-preservation, right? She yes, narcissistic. She reacted. Narcissistic. She she grabs the metal, shoves him in the water, and now she has to cover her tracks. And it's like you're eight, you're eight years old. You're so. How do you do that? Yeah. Uh, how do you think that many details, yeah. specific details? Yeah. And how do you think of all the things to say to people who are going to question you? Yeah. And how do you hide the metal? And yeah, just where'd you put the metal when you grabbed it? I want to play the way we used to, Mommy. Will you play with me? If I give you a basket oh, of kisses, what a play. Please. Can't you give me an answer, Mother? If I give you oh, a basket I of kisses. Want you to, I want you to go in your bedroom now and read because I have to think about what to do. Promise me you won't tell anyone what you've told me. Do you understand? Why would I tell and get killed? And Christine says, when we lived in Wichita, that old woman who promised you the crystal you know, the, the crystal ball, what, what happened there? And Rhoda says, well, there was ice on her. <laughs> it's just so dramatic. There was ice on the steps. <laughs> and yes. She, uh, she <laughs> slipped and fell. Only she didn't slip by accident. I pushed her. Yeah. Rhoda, what happened to old Mrs. Post in Wichita? There was ice on the steps, and I slipped and fell against her. And that was all. That was all? No. I slipped on purpose. You know, I wanted that that uh, that crystal ball. And so we see that A, she's murdering people for things that she to get what she wants. B, she's keeping trophies just like you brought up. I thought that was a brilliant point. And uh, Christine is beside herself. And so to protect yes. her daughter, because here's the thing, right? Miss Fern has to watch out for the reputation of her school. Uh, Christine has to watch out for not just her daughter, but her own reputation. Christine's dad is watching out for his reputation. That's why he's keeping the, the Bessie Denker origin a secret. So there's a lot of covering people's tracks here. Yes. And uh, so she, she tells, she screams at her, put those views in the incinerator and burn them. And so they do. Things don't ever burn all the way. I'm telling you. End, end act one. <laughs> intermission, but there's no intermission in this movie. No. So it's the next day and Rhoda is sitting outside. I think she's reading a book perhaps at this point. Under that tree, that sick was it sycamore tree? This oh, she, she gives it a name. name because she goes upstairs and yes. tells her mom, when we move to our house, can uh, we have can a... We have a something something yeah. tree tree it's just yes. it gives the most beautiful shade and uh, <laughs> when i when i did the play i had to look up that tree because yeah. i wanted to make sure that it was <laughs> a real tree <laughs> yeah this is really real and what kind of tree and what are we doing here yeah we have to say it right so earlier there was a scene where Leroy convinces her and here's the thing she's smart but she doesn't know everything right if you tell lies like that you won't go to heaven when you die 
Well, she can fool some people with that innocent look she can put on, put off whenever she wants to, but not me. Not even part way she can't fool me. Don't want to talk to nobody smart, huh? Like to talk to people she can fool, like a mama and Mrs. Breedlove and Mr. Emery. There's some Excelsior for you. You talk silly all the time. I know what you do with the Excelsior. You made a bed of Excelsior down the basement, behind that old furnace. And you sleep there, where nobody can see you. So he convinces her that they're, you know, he tells her, I think you hit that boy and with a stick and you threw the bloody stick in the woods and there's these set stick bloodhounds who will that sniff is the that best and, line oh my <laughs> god it's so good and they got this they got this powder they'll put on the stick and it'll turn a pretty blue color if there's blood on it <laughs> you know i think you're a very silly man well you was silly thinking you could wash off blood and you can't why can't you wash off blood because you can't and the police know it. You can wash and you can wash it. There's always some left. Everybody knows that. I'm going to call the police and I'm going to tell them to start looking for that stick in the woods. They got what they call stick bloodhounds to help them look. And them stick bloodhounds can find any stick there is that's got blood on it. When they bring in that sticky wash off so good, the police are going to sprinkle some special blood powder they got on it. And that little boy's blood is going to show up on that stick. Going to show up a pretty blue color like a robin's egg. You're scared about the police yourself. Shh. When you say about me, it's all about you. They'll get you with that powder. <laughs> she, you know, he convinces her of this and she is actually, she goes up and asks her mom about it. So that was earlier in the film. This second interaction right. is very, he's playing with her there. In this one, he figures shit out and it's real scary because he now he's afraid of her, right? Before he yes. was just trying to uh, make her angry and now he's afraid. And, and you saw that when he went down to his bed when he brought his new Excelsior down and yes. he was on his, you saw that look of fear on his face. Yeah. Like, what did I do? What did yeah. I do? And how do I get out of this? Yeah. He, I, I think he knows he went too far. And show where that little boy's blood was. Plenty left to put you in the electric chair. Give me those shoes back. Oh, no, I got them shoes hid where no bottom of me can find them. You better give me those shoes. They're mine. Give them back to me. I ain't giving them shoes back to nobody. You better give them back to me, Leroy. I'm keeping them shoes. <laughs> Well, he notices, I where are your, where, I don't see your shoes, tap, tap, tapping on the concrete. And she says, I burned those shoes. And, and, you know, he says, I know you did. And I took them, but I took them out of the incinerator before they got burned and I have them. And then he's, he jokingly says, I bet you use those to hit the little boy. And then she freaks out and he realizes, oh no. Who says I got anybody's shoes except both? You did, you get them and give them back. I'm fooling you, I'm teasing, I got nobody's shoes. I got work to do. Give me back my shoes! I got nobody's shoes. Don't you know what anybody's teasing you? Will you bring them back? Play with your puzzle. I got no shoes. I keep telling you. Will you bring them back? I believe you did it. I was fooling before, but now I believe you kill him. You kill a little boy with his shoes. You've got them hid. Give him back. Give him back. Yeah. yeah. Give, give me give back them. my shoes. Um, and oh he realizes, God. oh, no, you really did use these shoes to hit that little, little boy. Yeah. And scary. Uh, scary. You know, they part ways. And yeah, he goes into into the boiler room where he lives. He's made a little nest for himself, basically, when he's, you know, taking a break from work and finds the the burned up shoes in the incinerator. And he, he lays down on that Excelsior and he's afraid of her. And he I would be yeah. I'd be moving. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. Uh, now at I this moving. at this point, while Rhoda is still downstairs, Mrs. Daigle returns to the home, and she's just as drunk, if not more drunk, as she was before. And Christine, have you got anything in the house to drink? Any little thing at all? I'm not the fussy type. I prefer bourbon and water, but any little thing will do. It's very interesting interaction. The first time she was, you know, Christine was very kind to her, but she was a nuisance. She was trying to get out of her home. This time, Christine 
looks at her differently because now she knows that she does not come from the good stock that she thought that she did. Right. She um, knows that her daughter killed this woman's son and her interaction with, with Hortense is a lot more, I think in the first scene, it's sympathy. I think in the second scene, it's empathy. Empathy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You see the change Mm -hmm. and, and you see that, she understands that she could have been in that same, you know, predicament yes. of, you know, where, where you go, I could go. I mean, just, yeah. Yeah. And I am. Yeah. She's, I think she is brewing at that point. What yeah. can she do? What can she do? The loss, you know, can she allow this to go on? Yeah. She insists on seeing Rhoda. I want to have a little talk with Rhoda because she knows something. And, you know, Christine says, I'm, I'm sorry, she has an appointment. She can't make it, you know, and uh, and it's just this, oh, this just heart-wrenching, heartbreaking scene. It uh, is. I do, oh, I, you know, I do want to mention the first scene with Hortense. After she leaves, Christine and Miss Fern shake hands, right? And, and kind of, it, it, they they had this argument, but then after Hortense and her grief, they're like, they, they leave on not good terms, but they, they come to a little bit of like a an understanding an understanding. Uh, anyway. So this time around uh, Monica busts in and sees this happening. And then Rhoda. And takes busts, her. Yeah. Well, Rhoda busts in and Hortense grabs her and sits her down and says, could you just tell me any little old thing, anything about my boy? It might help me. And, you know, Rhoda, Rhoda, she just plays like innocent and she plays scared, you know, like, like she's afraid of this drunk woman. Not that, you know, she's probably really afraid that she's going to get caught, but she's playing. I would think that's the thing. Yeah. I I think she's afraid of getting caught. Yeah. Personally. But she convinces them that she's afraid because this woman's drunk and Monica snatches her up and she says, Oh, we have an appointment. We have to get you to some, you know, and gets her out of the room. And Hortense says, you know, well, I, I didn't realize that, Little girls had so yeah. many things to do, and she's uh, hoity toity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think. Do you think Hortense knows, or or what do you think? I think Hortense suspects. I really do that. Yeah. There's more to the story that nobody's telling. I don't think she believes that another child could kill another child. Right. Because I I don't think she thinks that. No. But I think that she knows more. Right. She saw more and she's not sharing. Yeah. Does and I do believe that she I always thought that Hortense thought she had the penmanship medal because where else could it be? Oh, she knows that. She knows that much for sure. Yeah. 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 yeah Cause she knows but Rhoda I don't wanted think she it so knows. Badly. I don't think she knows that Rhoda killed no. Claude. Now no. bef- before I, Rhoda I left the so. room, she grabbed a handful of matches out of a out of a, a little that jar. was creepy and christine says rhoda put those back now here's the thing if you knew your kid was on a killing spree and she grabbed I matches know. wouldn't you spank the hell out of her rhoda says i only wanted them to play jack straws and she will put them back you're not allowed to play with them so she puts them back but she keeps two and walks out the door i i i think i would never let my kid without checking and i would never have matches Right there. No. So low. Right. I mean, I, I know they all smoked. I know that. But still, I wouldn't do that because that's thing. I mean, yeah, CP, CP, <laughs> right. they come knocking at my door. You know, they come knocking at my door. And yeah. No, I, I just think that would be, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. That, that, but again, that was the time period and yes. they could get away with it, you know, but the idea that she could sneak out those two and that Christine be- still believed her. Hello. Hello. Right. Yeah. Your daughter killed. Hello. She's overwhelmed, you know, and she's, 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 she's got a drunk woman in her home and she's, I mean, I'm not making excuses for Christine at all. It's just, you know, trying to see where she's coming from and. Oh, she's uh, just fog, fog, fog. Yeah. Just, so, oh, I have to mention, there's, I have to mention two things because I don't want to forget. First okay. of all, number one, the 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 booze cart. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When they... I love, let's wheel out the booze cart. Well, you Hortense, know? Even, Hortense <laughs> comments on it, right? Oh, and we swank. 
Really plaza master. Oh my does it, God. Doesn't doesn't she it. says uh, no, it's so fancy, but doesn't she pour someone a drink and then she keeps the bottle for herself? Am I wrong? Yeah, she takes yeah. the bottle. No, she takes the bottle. Yeah. 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 But but I just thought it was just so funny that and you know what? My mom had a cart like that. Really? And whenever we had a party, she'd have she'd roll it out and put wow. the booze on it for parties. And I thought, ooh. <laughs> 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 what is this you know and the other thing i have to mention before i forget is that i had those little taps on my shoes as a little girl did you really yes my, it was a thing now they're, they are, are save they, your shoes yeah to preserve i've had them put on my i have a good pair of like air force boots i've had them put on my boots in the past yeah yeah i i remember many of my little mary jane shoes you know whatever that i had little yeah and i would i would click 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 yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, no, they, they make a difference. Before, yeah. They do. They, they, I've had they my do. boots for probably 10 years and they're in great condition because of those. Yeah, yeah. So I just thought that was interesting too. The two things that are quite normal for the time yeah. became really eerie, creepy clues. Yes. You know, yeah. well, I, I, I think they all drank too much and I think they all smoked too much too. Well, that's true. But that was the times. <laughs> that was the times too. All right, go ahead. Sorry. All right, so who all is in the home now? We have Hortense's left, and um, we have Monica. She she'll never. Uh, Monica she, takes her away. Yeah, she takes Rhoda and puts her in her own apartment upstairs, and then comes back down. And she's trying to talk to Christine, and something's wrong. You don't look great. And she tells her, you know, so it's been established that Rhoda takes vitamins every night, and she, you know, she's she says, "You can talk to me. You can open up to me. What's wrong?" And again, she's dismissive when Christine tries to infer, right? She says, well, you know what you need? Are you sleeping? No, I'm not. Well, this is what you need. I'll bring you some sleeping pills. And Christine says, you know, I'm afraid of them. I don't want them in the home. And she insists. And so she gives her a, 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 thing, of, a thing of the sleeping pills. And Christine says, I'll keep them separate from yep. the vitamins, you know, so that they're safe. Yes. And when this happens, we start hearing screaming downstairs. Rhoda comes in and starts playing her piano and she's playing Claire de la Lune again and it starts out slow but it speeds up it gets faster and faster and more intense and the screaming outside is coming from Leroy who is on fire and yes. Rhoda has that is the creepiest Oh. Well, and you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, obviously, we don't see him. This is all off camera. We see our 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 cast looking out the windows at him. Rhoda is pounding away at the piano. Christine is very upset. We hear Leroy screaming and screaming. Rhoda has set the Excelsior that he sleeps on on fire. <laughs> And they're just so they're just standing there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Christine's this is Christine's breaking point. It's too late. Somebody call an ambulance. He's lying still. Whatever can be done will oh, be yes. done. Oh yes, Monica, but night say. And screaming and crying. And Rhoda, why won't she stop that? And and Monica's like, What has Rhoda done? Tell me. And it 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 escalates into a crescendo of of Christine finally snapping. And it's all just yes. been too much. And this is the very end. I should have known that this was going to happen now. I should have known it. How could I be so blind? Thank God, Rhoda. You see, now the fire was in the basement where Leroy was. But there's nothing but we this can do. But this time I saw it, Monica. I saw this with my own eyes. Now make them stop screaming because it isn't going to help. Scream. Just in your life. And make her stop the music, Monica. Because that man is still screaming. And the piano is going on and on while he's dying in the fire. Monica. Screaming a man scream. Monica. I don't want to see anybody now. Yes. No, you can tell. It just, you know. You know. I think you know what's going to happen. You know, at the end. You know that she has. she has to fix this she has to she has no choice now so they've just watched the roy die christine has her her breaking point Monica, Monica. 
Oh, my God, I just simply can't bear it. Now she is driving me. Oh, no, no, can she play that tinkle now? Rhoda, I'm fucking in my music. Monica, I can't stand it. How can she play that music now? Rhoda, Rhoda, You didn't see it. Did that you know you could turn away? And did you know you could turn away? And you could say, what has she done? And, and we cut to later that night, and a, a bizarrely calm Christine, right, is getting because she already in. broke. Yeah. yeah. She already yeah. she already accepted mm-hmm. what she had to do. I uh, I I feel so bad because there was a moment when she was in the kitchen and Monica was trying to, you know, asking and asking, you know, if if, we know today, I mean, this was a different time period, but we know today that if someone was having such a a nervous breakdown, you need to do more than just, you know, let them go after a second. You need to do more. And that was so obvious. So obvious. I just, and then, you know, her reaching out to her husband and trying to, you know, do all these things to get him, you know, and then can't. There's just, she was such a loss. Such a, commentary yeah. on the fact that no one really sees her, right? She's she's yeah. flailing around and, and she, you know, there are times when she tries to, you know, tries to infer that she needs help and, and no one sees her. No one really listens. And like, what, how truthful is that to a woman's experience, particularly at this time? Yes. Being invisible. Yeah. Women are invisible, but women to another woman to another woman. Oh, women usually see each other better than that. At least we try to, you know, Uh, and that's sad. That's on Monica. Yes, it is. Really? Yeah. And, and yeah, that's why I wasn't, I didn't always care for Monica because I thought, shame on you. You know, I can see the men. Okay. I really can't. Yeah. But woman to woman. No, no, we aren't that way. We aren't built that way. No. Yeah. Sad, sad, sad. Yeah. Monica's very narcissistic. Too. Yes, you know, she just is. Me, 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 me. And yeah. narcissistic and blind and, you know, ignorant. So all of this has led Christine to put Rhoda to bed. And she tells her, you know, oh, we have new vitamins tonight. These aren't your normal vitamins. And uh, mm-hmm. Rhoda says, must I take so many? And she says, yeah, you know, Monica gave them to me. They're, you know, you're to take a lot of them. I'm to take them too. And, mm-hmm. you know, tells her daughter, I love you. And, you, you know, this is- Such a heartbreaking scene. It's so good. Oh, it's so good. I mean, she's just it's so, so- quiet. Yes. Calm. Mm-hmm. It's well, like I'm just gonna because say we goodnight. saw bef- we saw before that she reads her a bedtime story, and it's a sweet scene, and this is almost mirroring that right in in its calmness and in its quiet, and yet it's so upsetting because she is overdosing her daughter and giving herself these sleeping pills, mm-hmm. and Rhoda falls asleep, and Christine goes to the bedroom and closes the door. And just a moment later, we hear a gunshot. And I question that. Why do you do it so soon? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Maybe she would, if she waited, she couldn't have the guts to do it. Yeah. That's my other part. But but I also, um, it was just so quick. It, it is. It was just too quick. I think that's for it, timing, for shock value for the audience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with you, but it was so abrupt. It just bothered me. You certainly don't see given, it coming. No, you don't give Rhoda enough time to fall into that death sleep, you know? Yeah. 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 But yeah. Well, we cut to anyway. a hos- we cut to a hospital waiting room and Kenneth is back and Monica is there and grandpa is there and everyone's waiting. And, you know, Kenneth in his, it, it is a bad performance, right? You know, he's, he's, He's saying, you know, I I should have known or I should have been there. And, you know, that this is all my well, fault. Well, you didn't call, Kenneth. You never called. You never truly, were. <laughs> you <know>? Truly. Uh, <laughs> Monica says, you do have something to live for. 
we still have Rhoda and Rhoda uh. skips into the room and she has survived the little brat. <laughs> I know. It's just so you just you, your your hairs on your back are on fire. Yes. You know, and you're just like, what? Yeah. Now, from this point forward, we are this is at a, a different ending that was made for Hollywood. The Hayes Code at the time was, uh, if, if I understand correctly, came from the Catholic Church. And there were certain things that you could not showcase in cinema at the time, right? You could not showcase mm. homosexuality. You could not showcase certain types of violence. You couldn't showcase sex. And you couldn't showcase a bad guy winning. All means had to end with good prevailing at this time. So the only way that they got this film greenlit was by by agreeing to change the ending. So Kenneth and Rhoda are told, go home. Christine is in a coma and, you know, we we will call you if anything happens. They get home. But before that, the father asks the doctor, what are the chances? You know, or something. And I love it. Like one in a million. Yeah. What are the chances of of a child of someone being born, you know? Yes. Uh, Again, that whole evil. thing. Yeah. And the doctor, even this trained professional, right? If he's a professional in the writing field, this doctor is a professional in the medical field. And the doctor yes. says it's, you know, it's unlikely. The uh, dad needed. Yeah. The, the he needed that reassurance. needed that. He yeah. did. I thought that was interesting. That's a great point. They get home and Rhoda tells her dad, oh, well, Monica is going to take me sunbathing tomorrow. She's prepared a spot for us where no one will be able to see and uh, uh. Her, she says, you know, oh, she has these lovebirds that I just, you know, uh, she promised them to me when when she dies. Daddy, how long mm. did lovebirds live? <laughs> and he starts putting this together. And then he says, well, where are you sunbathing? And, you know, Rhoda says, oh, up on the roof where no one will be able to see us. Now we know she's going to kill Monica for these lovebirds. <laughs> yes. Ruthless, yes. which is have you ever seen the musical Ruthless? It's yes. A, yeah. So the whole first act is is a parody of this film, right? Because she's oh yeah. She's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So. Oh my God. Rhoda is put to bed. Christine calls from the hospital, and we see her. Her head is wrapped with gauze, and her makeup is <laughs> her makeup is flawless. She's really pulling off this I gauze know. look. <laughs> and, I know. I you know. know. But they have this sugary I hope moment. I look that good. And but... <laughs> <you're... laughs> they have this sugary <laughs> moment where Christine says, "I hope that." you know, God can forgive me for what I've done and we can move on. And I don't think Christine knows that Rhoda is alive yet. Maybe. No, I don't think she does. She doesn't. But we know that that Christine has survived this. Now in the play, Christine does not. Christine has died and Rhoda lives. Yes. We cut to Rhoda sneaking out of her room. She climbs out the window. She's got on a rain slicker. And And it's raining, pouring. Pouring down rain. parent would not hear a child leave in the i'm sorry maybe that's why because it's so it's thunder and lightning and, i don't know well we we have the the da, 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 music playing and she's got like she's, she's got like a stick or something in her hand and she's walking past the white picket fence and she's dragging it's a it along. flashlight it's the flashlight. A flashlight okay yeah yeah uh, dragging it along the white picket fence and it's making a click, 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 click noise. And she's walking yes. real fast. And it's it's great. It's very good filmmaking because it's intense. And uh, before Christine had given her the pill, she tells her, I took that metal and I put it in the water where, where Claude Dragle, Dagle drowned, right? Right. Now, right. So no one would ever find it. Yeah. Rhoda. By the reeds, by the... Yep. Right, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Rhoda makes her way to the, the dock and is trying to fish in the water, trying to find the metal. She's so like hell bent on getting this metal back. And, you know, even though it could incriminate her potentially, right. But she can't Mm -hmm. see past that. You know, she, she can use her cunning to convince anybody. We get the, this (laughs) ridiculous, controversial, frankly, I don't know, silly ending where the, the dock is struck by lightning and there's smoke and that's the yes. end of Rhoda Penmark. God got her. <laughs> yes, nature took care of it because she yeah. was, uh, uh, yeah, a force yeah. of nature. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to vomit right or now. No. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I didn't know until I was, I read the novel. I read the novel, I think when I was in like early high school, I got it from the library. I remember specifically the look of the book and everything. Cause I just always loved this movie. So I was very surprised at the ending of the novel that, you know, Christine dies and Rhoda lives and it's flipped in the film. Now, what I love is that the film says the end. And then we have an announcer say, one moment, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our wonderful cast. Oh, just a minute, oh, folks. Oh, God. God. <laughs> that is just, oh, <laughs> just a minute, worthy. folks. And he says a, a moment to uh, acknowledge our wonderful cast. And we get a curtain call in this movie. I know. I know. Is this Broadway or what? I know. You know? And so, you know, this is obviously to cut the tension. Uh, yes. Of, um, but then so- I don't understand why... When each of them come out, they're all fine and well, right? But when Rhoda comes out and then Christine comes out, you know, I thought when she did that little, mm, that little finger wagging at her, she would go over there and just tickle the heck out of her, right? Or do something silly. Instead, she throws her over her knee and spanks her. But it's in play. What they're is both, that? They're both laughing. And Miss Nancy Kelly as Christine Penmark. So I can't, I couldn't confirm this, but one source that I was researching said that this was actually part of the, the show's curtain call, that at the end of the Broadway play, people were so upset and angry that she lived, like fighting mad, that in the curtain call, Christine threw Rhoda over her knee and playfully spanked her in front of everybody so that the audience could leave on an up, like a, a silly happy. Oh, that would change everything. No. That yeah. Would change everything. You know, it, it takes oh. away from, I saw a production of The Crucible once. And the curtain call, right after John Proctor is hanged, the curtain call music was Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. Oh, my God. It was in <laughs> such poor taste. You have ruined every oh. bit of tension. You have ruined the point of this play by having everybody bop out and bow to Another One Bites the Dust. And the I feel dust. like this, you know, it's maybe terrible. maybe Broadway audiences needed that. It certainly sounds like Hollywood audiences needed that. You know, or Maybe at least at the, the studio thought that they did at the time, but it it negates, you, you know, it, all of the tension that we've built up. It, it this... takes away from all the work that the actors did to yeah. make you feel all that, yeah. and then it just it just nullifies. It's just like ah, it, yeah. it kind of throws you know? it away. Yeah, it throws it away. It um, but then I we always get... I always made sure it stayed. What I built stayed when we Good. did Diary of Anne Frank and we did this. I wanted you like I had people going out crying. Yeah. Yay. I did my thing. Yes. I succeeded. That was the reaction. And that will make you think and theater should make you think and, and, um, and feel. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do our job right, then we are, we are doing a disservice to our audience. Well, it's like, let, let a tragedy be a tragedy. You know, you don't, you've, you've worked for two plus hours to get your audience to this point. Let them, sit, let them sit in that. Yeah. Like art should yeah. make art should be uncomfortable at times, you know? Yes. Yes, for sure. And I always tell people when I did the play, I said, I, I don't care if you watch the movie. You know, I, I never did because, right. you know, if you want to, it's fine. But I said the end, I, I always told them, I always said to them, I hate the ending. You know, that is not how, you know, that is not the way it should end. We're going to make sure we do it right, yeah. you know, and such. And I said, that is just ridiculous, totally yeah. ridiculous. So they ruined, to me, they ruined, ruined, you know, all that, you know, yeah. that little bit. They did. They took it away. Well, they, you know? we also get a disclaimer, a, a text card that reads due to the, you know, shocking nature of our, of our production. We ask that you please do not divulge the climactic yes. ending of this to others, like let them watch it for themselves. So literally asking people, don't tell people about the ending of this movie. And I think that's fair because people do that today too. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, wasn't you the know. movie, did you ever see the crying game? It was on I probably the, have. The, the, the big surprise, the poster for the movie told people, you know, everyone's talking, but don't tell about the secret of this movie right well didn't clue do that too or something like do not tell i mean there are a lot of an agatha i mean i remember i have seen that before yeah that you, that you should not tell there is another is it diabolique i think does that as well 
Um, I think it's a fair thing to ask an yes. audience, you know, like yes. let it, if you're going to change the ending to Rhodey getting struck by lightning, let that happen. And then give us that text card, you know, and let that be your ending. I didn't need the curtain call. And it, it is nice to be able to acknowledge mm-hmm. all of these actors, but I don't need it in a, in a, I need, I want it on the stage when they are in front of me and I can thank them with applause. But not in the movie. I don't need it. Oh, in that the movie. was just, yeah. no, no. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, yeah, it, it, it's I don't just, like it. Seeing her giggle while she's getting spanked is it's just too much. It, you know, because now it was, it's, it's, it was not, it's not it's not it's not Christine spanking Rhoda. It is Nancy spanking, spanking Patty, tr- McCord. Patty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's wrong. And that's yeah. wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. Patty silly. played her part really well. Yes. And, and she deserved for us to for, hate her. Yeah. Yeah. That was the fun part of the whole thing. Yeah, but anyway, that. that's the bad <laughs> seed. I love this movie so, so much. Oh, man. It's so good. I uh, That's why I had to do it. Well, like I said, once I read it, saw it, I knew I had to do it one day. Yeah. And I had the perfect person to play, um, you know, the little little Rhoda. She Did was you really? just so perfect. Yes. Uh. Yes. It was Shelly. And and my little Shelly and and it, she was a freshman and she had blonde hair too and I mean and we made the little dresses and the little Mary Jane shoes and oh my God she was creepy oh God Good. and it's funny is my my um, Leroy was Ben Ben wrote. And he is now, I think he's a superintendent at a school district. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love this. You know, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, this cast was phenomenal. It was yeah. just a really great cast and it was fun. It was wow. fun. So well, let me ask you this as a teacher, as an educator, right? Miss Fern could sense that there was something wrong, wrong with Rhoda. Did you have students that you could sense there was something um, upsetting about them? You don't have to name names. I wouldn't. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't. Because I don't remember names right now, too. I should ah. say, oh my God, names just come and go. I'm telling you. Um, so many files in this brain I'd have to pull from to get yeah. the name. Um, no. Uh, yeah, there were people. Yeah. And there were people that I did report. Sure. And did let the, the counselors know, the office know. Yes. For sure. Yeah. For yeah. sure. And one, I didn't let them know until it was too late. And it was an awful thing that yeah. happened. And um, he was expelled. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to bring the mood down like that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Teachers know. Yeah, of course. Teachers just know. Yeah. And yeah. And I used to have people who say, my child will never lie to me. Mm-hmm. And I used to say, hmm, okay. I, I I say all children lie. Yeah, <laughs> that's you that. what a foolish thing to what a foolish thing to think. I know. I lie. You know? Adults lie. Children yeah. lie. It's just the way it is. And if you want to hear the other side, I'll tell you. But yeah, you know, exactly. If you don't, you don't. You know. I mean, if you want to live in your <laughs> bubble, go ahead. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but they do. Well, uh, here on the show on Rick or Treat Horrorcast, we have a rating system for the movies that we talk about. Uh, it's one of three categories. A movie is either a trick, which means it's okay, or it's a treat, which means you love it, or a movie is a, quote, smell my feet, which means it sucks and you hate it. How would you rate The Bad Seed? I'd always rate it a treat. Yeah, same. I would, because it holds it holds so many memories for me. And again, it is horror, and it's one of the few horror movies that I adore. Yeah. And that I understand and love and don't dream about that I can, you know, I love the psychological part of it. Yeah. It's yeah. a treat. Yeah. It's I think treat. it's an excellent film. I, uh, you know, I've really wanted to, I, on this podcast, I just started in October. I can't talk about all of my favorite movies at once or I won't have anything to talk about months from now, you know? So I'm, right. incorpor- I'm incorporating these films. Uh, these more classic films slowly integrating them you know i'll do the haunting from 64 and i'll do psycho and you know i'll incorporate them as i go along but i can't talk about and i did watch psycho i have seen psycho did you really 
And I have seen Shiny. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, scary. I know. I know. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that was part of my nightmare times. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I have seen some. <laughs> well, I, I wanted I wanted you on this episode because I remember I remember I think it was my it was directly in front of my desk where I sat in your class was your poster from your production of The Bad Seed. And so, you know, I thought it would be a great conversation. Little pigtail girl. Yep, exactly. Yep. I yeah. Think, I think yeah. there was a lot of green in the poster, maybe, and yellow writing. I can't remember for sure. Because, well, she had the yellow hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The blonde, blonde hair. Yeah. And the red dress. The yes. red dress. I gave the red dress to my student. Like Did that. you really? That's great. Well, who else would wear that? Of course. I mean, <laughs> You're not going to read. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who else? I wouldn't do that. Yeah, that was cool. That was thank, the coolest thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast with me. It's uh, it's been oh, a it lot was of my fun. pleasure. This is so much fun. Yeah, well, and- invite me back again someday. I will. I will. Absolutely. Uh, I will find we'll, we'll find another movie to talk about for sure. Uh, you can actually a fun fact. So I write film reviews for spoilerfreereviews.com, and actually, so does Esta. Esta, you want to talk about spoilerfreereviews.com for a minute? Ah. It's an online site that gives reviews on movies, film, excuse me, films. I should let me say there. Films, right. books, TV shows, Broadway shows, podcasts, you name it. You know, we will review it. But the unique thing about Spoiler Free is that we don't give away the plot. We try to keep that safe so that you can't say, ah. I didn't want to know that so that when you go in to see this, whatever it is that we review, you go in with a clean slate, but knowing what we thought about it and knowing some details, but not enough to give it away. And we have emojis that tell you how we feel about the movie. It could be a vomit or it could be a meh, which is like a B or C movie. And it's then it's a must see with stars and we rate them. So, and we take that very seriously, I think, you know, so it's, it's great to review. I, I love doing it. And then I have a classic corner too, which I love doing. I, I just adore old movies and not just old movies, like you said, like from way back, but just classics from the decades, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, the classics mean anything, right? It's just a classic. And if you would want to see it over and over again. And so I, I love writing my classics and that's fun too. I do that once a week. So it is. You're so great. It's it's all. I I love that we get to, you know, have uh, this project that we are both a part of now. And it's such a wonderful wonderful website and a wonderful group of contributors. And there's nine of us. Yeah, nine or ten of us. I mean, it's 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 a very eclectic group from all over the United States. And and so you get different opinions mm-hmm. and people who are very knowledgeable about film very knowledgeable about different genres. You know, it's, it's just amazing. I, I learn a great deal you know, and I have grown as a, as a writer from me doing too. this. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I have you to thank for getting me on board with that. You put me in touch with Aaron. I'm so glad. Who's yeah, wonderful. I'm so glad. And yeah. probably add the bad seed to your classics corner at some point, right? At some point I will. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, I have, maybe this Halloween. You said you, maybe you said you have a list. Oh my God, I just keep adding. My list is huge. I yeah. can review classics for <laughs> yeah. months and months and months. Yeah. yeah, it's just insane. It's just insane because there's so much good stuff out there. Well, but I'm it, not reviewing horror. No, that's me. I'm the horror guy. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you're, the, you're the expert. I bow to you. I bow to you. Yes. So yes. It, yes. In yes. It, in addition to spoilerfreereviews.com, you can check out more of my contributions on Rue Morg. That's rue-morg.com. And by the time this episode drops, my website should be going. It's rickretreat.com. Keep an eye out for merchandise and t-shirts for the podcast. And I thank you all very much for listening. Esta, thank you again for coming and being on the oh, show. I my wait. pleasure. You're welcome. Love you, love you, love you. I love you too. And I can't wait to have you back. <laughs> and uh, thanks, listeners. Oh. We'll see you all later, spookies. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming Rick or Treating. You can follow the show on Instagram at Rick or Treat Pod. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. 
The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre, with orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. Links to the artist's music can be found in the episode description. Check him out, he's frighteningly talented. Rick or Treat Horrorcast is independently produced by me, Ricky J. Duarte, of Rick or Treat Productions. If you like what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well... They're coming to get you, listener. <laughs>